<laughs> Welcome to maturation. 101. Others may, you cannot. We call this study, this Bible study, maturation because it is the process of development of going from one destination, which is childlike, to another conclusion or goal, which is mature or mature. Oftentimes, here in America, we do not know what maturity is. We have people that are riding bicycles for money. We have people that are beating each other up to a pulp to get paid. As a matter of fact, if you put money to it, just about anything out there can be turned around to be something that supposedly we admire as sports legends. We elevate them as being some kind of heroes. We treat them as though they were adults, when in fact they may be more childlike than we realize. The Bible does not pick and choose its exact details as far as what a man is. We are told that God created man in his own image, so the only reality that we have of what a mature person would look like or act like is Jesus. And obviously by what Jesus said in Matthew, when he spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, we do not measure up to the full stature of what a man should be, because while we could be like Jesus, we are not. We're Americans. So, in a mature way, we have to acknowledge the fact that we're not what we think we are, but what we really are are spoiled brats. And so this study is about growing up, and growing out of some of the bad influences that we've allowed ourselves to look at, to think, and to ponder and conceive of somehow pretending that a football hero would be a minister of God. Dare I say, we had someone recently that gave up a promising career and went down to the Aka Indians and died as a martyr, who wound up saving the entire tribe because of his wife, impressed by what this man had done. Through the Gates of Splendor is a book that I would recommend for you to read if you want to understand the struggles of men that are being called to grow up and to assume the mantle of manhood. I don't know many men. I know a lot of men as boys. I understand the concept of a man cave, but in reality it's a slob's pen, and it's a pig pen. Now it may have an office, it may have other things, but a man has a study. A man has a den. It's not a cultural, and it's not an epic time of some time frame that we change it. No, I've seen what man caves are, and what man caves are used for. Don't tell me it's a library or it's a den. Take Jesus in there and put in the middle of your man cave something like an altar unto God and see how long that man cave lasts. I would assume that probably what would happen is you'd be embarrassed and move it to one wall or someplace else. But it would be an easy reminder to remind us to do one thing. And this is, I'm not trying to embarrass you or humiliate you because every man is childlike inside. We get caught in our immaturity a lot. We get caught with our pants down. You can see that about Bill O'Reilly. You can see that about President Trump. You can see that about a lot of people that are elevated in positions of authority that get stupid at some point in time. So it's not something or some condition that is relevant to only certain types of people, but it's everyone's issue that we all, in our own way, have to grow up to become women that are women of God, to become men that are men of God. In other words, it's like this, and we said it in the last study. What if you had a baby, and you went into your crib, your room that you had for the baby, and you looked down into the crib, and you saw your cute little baby, you know, cooing and cawing and going, doo doo da da, and he's just going away, say, daddy, you know, and you wiggle him and goo goo him, you know, and kind of, you know, and they go, you know, and you, you, you get it, you know, you get touched by that, you, you know, you're enraptured, you're, you adore them. Now picture 30 years later going in there and falling, seeing a full grown man laying in a crib, and you go to touch him or you go to speak to him, and he goes. You know, the image is disgusting. It's gross. It's obscene. That's why we need to grow up. We need to put on as the elect all these different virtues that should be a part of our life. We don't. 
That's why we have this Bible study. <laughs> That's why, you know, I, I'd love to take it serious with you, but how do you grow up? I mean, I can tell you how anyone that's around you would tell you how you grow up. They send you the Marine Corps. Really. Seriously. Most of the time, you're going to find that a lot of people were immature, whiners, babies, crybabies, whatever you want to call them, with bottles, until they got put into the military service, and all their crutches and toys and everything was removed, and they were hopefully in some of the services, I hope all of them do it, but the Marine Corps does, crushed down to the bare necessities and then brought back up to act a different way. Hopefully, maturely. Now, I'm not going to say that every graduate from the Marine Corps is a man, but they are operating on a different standard and a different level than they were before they went in. They have a better chance of becoming a man. Sadly, they may have violence issues, but well, that's a whole other story. Last study, we talked about, and we did an overview of Others May, You Cannot, and we expressed the whole concept of being led of the Spirit by the Spirit so that the Spirit of God could change us, rearrange us, purify our hearts, cleanse our minds, deal with us in a way that we want to be dealt with, not given half, but need of the Word, not treated as though we were stupid, or ignorant, or shuffled off into the playground or the sandbar to play, you know, childish games, but that we would be fit for sound doctrine, for maturation, for maturity. We mentioned that we wanted to give you a homework assignment that I hope some of you did. I hope you went out and you purchased, or you went out and found one free. <laughs> I don't want you to buy books. This isn't my book. I don't get a commission off this. This isn't owned by somebody. You know, they're going to make buku bucks off it and go around a seminar and, you know, coach you and do all the other things that rip you off or, you know, get a bunch of men together so that they can have a party. I mean, you know, a lot of the boys' clubs, like this one woman said, you know, it's a club. They get together and they, they, they get stupid. I mean, I've been to a few men's Bible studies and, frankly, you know, I'm not big on them. So, when I say maturation, I think it should be men and women sat down together to grow up together and to be mature enough to say, this isn't a woman's study, this isn't a men's study, this is a grow-up session. Yeah. Because, you see, a man will put on airs around a woman, and a woman will try to do things to attract a man. Well, if we can get honest about it, then we can actually be in front of each other, let our hair down, because some woman's going to look at that guy and say, he's a jerk. You know, and I could say he's a jerk because I have a feminine side that I'm probably more in touch with than my man side, but the point is, a jerk is a jerk, and men know that they're jerks, but they get away with it because when they're around one jerk, he manages to influence others to be just as jerky as they are, or he is. And so it seems to be kind of a boys' club issue. I mean, pastors at Calvary Chapel retreats, I've been to some of them, and I think that, my God, I would fire them all. I've listened to what they talk about. Boy, as soon as the seminar is over or whatever the speech is done, you, you listen to them walking out of the building. I fire them. <laughs> I'm telling you. I listened to a lot of it, and I went only to one or two, and I went, you know, I can't do this. This is ruining my relationship with God. So I don't go anywhere near retreats or seminars or whatever they call it nowadays because I don't think they're real. I don't think they really want God. They want to go on vacation, you know. Now, it's true. There are good ones out there. I know. I don't know where they are. God only knows. I don't know, but I don't know. You know, and so I don't comment on them. But I'm just telling you, brass tacks. If you're finding yourself in that, this isn't this that kind of story. We're not playing here. We're serious. We're sober-minded. We recognize that not only are we living in the last days, but we are living in the last generation as the last days of the last generation, and that. We are probably in the last minutes and hours before, prophetically, that the Lord returns. Now, I don't mean when I add that word prophetically that's going to be like 10 years in the future. I mean it could be this year. And I've never said that before 2017. Anytime between the years 2017 and 2034, we are 100% confident that there's an 80% probability that Jesus will return. He's not coming back to pat you on the back. <laughs> you know, Jack? He's coming back expecting some things from you. And that's where this maturity study is going to take you to. 
we have to go through a process of boot camp, so to speak, to get you at least on the starting ground or the starting line so you understand how to run this race so you can at least get to the place where we can communicate to you truths about being what a man of God is. You can go out and buy a book on it, and I'm telling you, I've seen all the books. Man, you talk about, you know, pacifying and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, you take a 20-year-old, you know, and you can't expect much trouble until you got to give him a little bit of milk, you know, and take him along the way. Not me, man. I'd slap the sucker right alongside the head and here, wake up! Jesus is coming! Treat your wife right! Quit screwing around! Put away the porno! I mean, literally, I'd slap alongside the head. And then woman, hey, what's up with the makeup? I mean, don't get me wrong, I believe in makeup. <laughs> Man, do I believe in makeup. Man, I think more women ought to have makeup. <laughs> but done right. You know what I'm saying. You know, um, I don't have to be like Jay Bird McGee who said, if the bar needs painting, paint it. No, I mean, you know when you're doing it as an alluring style or as an enhancing style. You know when you're, you know, like, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, this cleavage looks pretty good, and I don't like cleavage. But when the cleavage is down to your belly button, you know what you're doing. Now, I don't mind a woman in a bikini either. Like, I'm not trying to make you into a puritanist, you know. Because, hey, I grew up in Newport Beach and we had three bikinis, you know. Huh. I mean, you know, that's about the way I looked at it. It was like, really? And walked away. I personally don't get all excited about a woman's body in the nude. I think that it's just like, huh, eh, physical fitness. I mean, women have to deal with men in the hospital when they're doing all kinds of different procedures and processes. And because I was grown up in the hospital quite a bit with a curable disease, I guess I had that attitude that I'm not all attracted to naked bodies. Sorry, it doesn't work that way for me. Put a lot of clothes on it that are sensual or sexual and it probably attracts me. I'm like, whoa! But, you know, stick a naked person in front of me, I'd probably give them a coat. Sorry, I don't work that way. And that's where we have to grow up. Women, I'm told, think the same way as men, sort of. You know, they scope other women out, you know, see what they look like, and then that's what my wife says, and they scope out man, so let's put the scopes away and get back to the reality of what God has to say today. Today you need to be mature. You need to get a handle on what we call self-discipline. It's not self-awareness. It's not self uh, self-deprecating. There we go. It isn't self-deprecating saying, I'm the worst. No, it's saying, I'm a sinner, and acknowledging that, yeah, I do lust. Yes, I do have issues. Yes, I do look at porno, or whatever you look at. I mean, my God, you know, I think porno is probably stupid in that, you know, some of the, what is it? I think my wife is more guilty of lust when she watches home builders than, than I would be of looking at porno, thinking that somehow I'm lusting at the porno. I don't think so. It's pretty disgusting. But... No, I mean, really, that's what my, I think my wife is, because she just drools over houses, you know, in that home builders or home buyers thing, you know. Don't interrupt her. Man, there's an addiction going on there. But, seriously, whatever it is, it's idols. Put it aside, get it out of your mind, get it out of your heart. Start to put away your idols. Start to move in a way of learning self-discipline. You'll do it for when you want to get something, like at a job or somewhere else or a sporting event. It's time to put that same self-discipline in front of your relationship with God to grow up and to become a man or a woman. And being a woman, you know, that means you got to grow up so that your kids, and women grow up faster than men and at a quicker rate, but you got to grow up so that your kids have something to look at. Because if they're looking at a husband but who's a first-time father, yeah. You know, I hope he had a good relationship with his dad because otherwise you're looking at a guy that's just, you know, faking it till he makes it. So, wanting to not, you know, beat your chops up, you know, too much because we are in boot camp stage of this maturation process and it's only the third video in case you're wondering. But in this Bible study that we're doing, we had told you to go out and get this book and that every day you should be reading it because simply said it is put into everyday readings. And the date is the 12th, so I didn't want you to slide, but I wanted to give you an example of a believer. I don't say follow me as I follow him, like Paul would, but I say, hey, you be thou an example of a believer so that people would say, what's different? And then you say, I follow Jesus, and then point to him and tell them to follow him on their own, not follow you. Don't become, you know, God to someone or the Holy Spirit. You're not. You're a sinner saved by grace. You're an example of someone who's been forgiven 
and someone who's growing up to become mature or mature in a way that is presentable to God so that you can live in eternity. So you are being selfish in one way. You want to be ecocentric enough to know that you have a problem and you need to deal with it. That's the eccentricities that we need to identify for ourselves to put ourselves in the right place with God so that others would be attracted to our relationship with God because then they want what we got. Right now, honey, I look around and ain't nobody got what I want. <laughs> Sorry. You know, and I want to find somebody so I can say, would you please give me what you got? Because that's how I got saved. I want what they got. And then I got it, and now I'm looking around going, where'd they go? <laughs> so today, just to give you an example of what you should be doing besides our study of others may you cannot, being led by the Spirit of God, this is what you're supposed to be doing at home, like in the morning, noon, and night. Because, like I said, you can't keep it right, and you can't keep it straight, so you need to do it more often than you think in order to remind yourself what it said, because you won't remember it once you read it in the morning, you'll forget it by noon. So read it three times a day, you know, and just kind of let it sink in or let it apply. And believe me, I already read the title just now while I was kind of glancing, and I went, whoa, boy. And that's the way I am with God. God, how come you speak? You know what I mean? I have a perfect, uh, you know, relationship with God, and I'm like, how can people say you don't talk, man? You don't shut up when it comes to me. I'm always getting stuff from God. God is always speaking to me. I, I don't get it. You know what I mean? I don't understand anyone else. You know what I mean? You don't? Why not? What's, you know, I want to go up. To God. I want to live with them for about a month or a year and find out what's wrong with them. How come they don't get God to speak to them? He said he would. So, before I get into this, I want to take a sip of Pepsi. Because it's been like, I'm all wound up because I just read the first line. Well, imagine what happens when God talks to me more than one sentence. Woohoo! By the way, if you heard that, woohoo! That's uh, what I write on the internet a lot, so now you know what it sounds like. Have you ever been alone with God? When they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Man, I mean, I know I've already said this two or three times on this tape series, but man, oh man alive, if you didn't get that, if you didn't get a handle on that, you got to get right with God, I'm telling you. I do it all the time. I hear somebody says, I go back, uh, hold on, you know, tell them the person, uh, you know, typing or whatever, or writing or even in person, hold on, let me go check with you. Lord, what do you think? And God tells me. When they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Hello, that's Mark 434. Look it up if you want to. He expounded, explained to the nth detail everything about what was going on at that particular time and what they should have done or should have said or could have said or didn't do or should have done. And yet, we act like God is deaf, dumb, and mute and that we have to interpret him. Grow up. Our solitude with him, Jesus does not take us alone and expound things to us all the time. He expounds things to us as we can understand them. Others' lies are parables. God is making us spell out our own souls. It is slow work, so slow that it takes God all time and eternity to make a man and woman after his own purpose. <laughs> You, you know, I'm going to stop there because I know I'll go, I'll go off. <laughs> Paragraph two you won't like either. We have to get rid of the idea that we understand ourselves. Whoa, baby. Today's homework, you know, go back and read it for today's message from My Utmost First Highest. You aren't going to like it, but that's your boot camp for the day. You know, trust me, it'll tell you everything you need to do to be and to say, because it really does get right in the heart. And if you're not getting the message, you call me personally on my phone, and I'll talk to you for about five minutes, and we'll get it right. <laughs> I'll just pull up whatever it is, um, my unload for his highest, and I'll read it to you and explain it to you if we have to get you to understand it's talking to you personally. Because believe me, God will use me that way. If it's that bad that you don't get it, you will got it, but you won't like it. Because it tastes good, but it ain't the kind of food that you think. So, now that we've established our homework, 
and that we should be doing that every day. Remember, every day you're supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be reading that. So you get through it maybe in one year, and, and uh, then you can decide for yourself if you don't want to do that. But I can tell you, you'll change. You'll be mature or better equipped to become an adult if you read that every day. And follow it if you can. Other people have all kinds of ideas about how to grow up as a man of God. What we've done is that we've identified that we want to study this particular instance of others may, you may not, so that we would be found in a syllabus style of proceeding from a catechism that was once used in the Heidelberg Catechism to disciple people so that before they were accepted as a Christian, they went through a process of education to become a Christian. You see, we have done something really weird compared to what Jesus did. Jesus called people to himself, but they were just followers. They were not disciples. They were not Christians yet. Thousands of people followed Jesus, you know, up until the point that he spoke to them personally, and they were challenged by personal conviction to either make a choice for the world or make a choice to follow Jesus and do what he says, even if they don't understand it. And they left. They booked, baby. They were out of there as fast as they could get, which is kind of what happens in maturity Bible studies. When you tell someone about growing up, they come for one, the first one. They like it. You can talk to them afterwards. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, you know, it's almost like the same parable of that seed that is planted and then, you know, the things of the world come up and it chokes out the plant, you know, and gradually it dies for lack of water or lack of sustenance because its roots were either not deep enough or it was on cement or people trampled on it or the birds snatched it and took it away. Hey, I can only tell you this. If you want to grow up, you've got to put up and shut up and do what it said in the first Bible study, which is, if you're going to come after Jesus, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. And if your cross is such that you think just getting there or getting here to watch this, to view it when you have any time you can watch it anytime you want to, is hard. Dude, taking up your cross means you're going to die. It doesn't mean you're going to live. So grow up. Get up. Quit playing games and act like you are not ready to be a man, but rather you are a child, and you are being taught to and fro with everyone in the doctrine, and now you need to learn so that you can be called children of the Most High God, sons and daughters of God. Grow up. Get up. Do it. Women are faithful to usually do a study, but they're harder to apply it personally when they have a core group that they want to assemble together with each other, because then they usually form cliques. Men, they typically just flat out rebel. <laughs> Complete, absolute, uh, uh I ain't doing it. So, the criteria you're going to find in this study, the absolute truth that you're going to find throughout your entire Bible study, and every time that you look in the scriptures when you're talking about Jesus, you're going to find a very interesting word that is in Matthew 16, 24, 25, that maybe you forgot what it said at the very beginning, but it's going to say the same thing at the very beginning with the same word, and others may you cannot, and that word is, if. I know. I'm a man. I know. I've seen women. If. Doesn't mean you will. Doesn't mean you're gonna. You can, you know, sign a voucher to say that you'll pay, or sign an agreement that says you'll show up, or make a statement that declares your faith. The children of Israel with Joshua made a statement and said, hey, tell us what the Lord will say. We'll do it. Whatever he has to say, we'll follow. And Joshua said, no, you won't. I live with you. He says, you'll say it now, but you'll leave it later. And then God will bust you for it. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he was right. They all made a, oh, we'll do it no matter what. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, we'll do it, we do it, we do it, we agree. And behold, it wasn't a generation before they'd already turned their backs on God and walked away. Revivals, they're good for that night. 
But Jesus didn't call people Christians because they got up and followed him. When all those people left him after following him, he looked at his disciples that he had chosen, that God had appointed for him to be his closest students. And he said, what are you going to do? Fortunately for us, the Holy Spirit took over Peter's mouth and said, you know, you have the words of eternal life. You know, we we're hanging out with you. We're going to hang with you and we're going to live with you. You know, we've, we've been here all along and we're going to continue on. Not in the exact words, but that's what he said. So, narrowing it down to 12, they went on to become the disciples and the followers of Jesus that were faithful even unto death. They became, by their life choices and style, Christians. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I, frankly, when I meet somebody or they, you know, want to accept Jesus, I go, you know, bluntly, really? Are you sure? Because, you know, I mean, they may have heard a lot of stories and heard a lot of things, but I'm sure they haven't heard the gospel according to Michael. <laughs> it's like, uh, I got saved a certain way, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to get saved that way. And for me, it was just about love. You know, I followed love. But the way Jesus presented the gospel was, if any man, if, 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 if any man come after me, if anyone would come to me, I will in no wise cast out. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He ain't playing games. He said, look, it'll cost you. To be a Christian costs you. It's not a question of, I've got a plan for your life. No, I've got a plan that makes you give up your life. Because anyone that seeks to save his life will lose it, and whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. As it says in our first study, as we are reviewing it through this now preamble to our third study, that, hey, you're giving your life. You're not just saying, ah, oh, you know what, I choose heaven over hell. Well, that's nice. That don't make you a Christian. Well, I'm going to take what you're offering me, you know, eternal life. Well, that's not a Christian. I'm going to accept the fact that, you know, you, you, you're God, you know, and that you paid the price. Well, that's still not a Christian. Because I got news for you. The ones that are Christians are going to be there standing before Jesus and he's going to say, well done, now good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. The ones that are Christians are still going to be standing there before Jesus, but he's going to say, get away from me, I never knew you. He said what it was all about, and it wasn't just simply feeding people clothing people, but it said they know me. Because they know me, they feed people, and they clothe people, and they take care of people. Because they see Jesus in them, and demonstrate it to them, as they would do unto Jesus. Love. Now, don't tell me about love, you know, and try to pretend that it's somehow John 3.16, and that you're going to, you know, love the world, and that you're, you know, going to tell me next that, you know, you love your enemies, and that somehow, you know, it's a process, and that you can compromise that to mean that, well, you know, I love my enemies until my enemy shows up at my door and then I have to kill them or protect myself. It's not what Jesus said. So, settle it now, we said last week in the Bible study, and that's why I'm leaving it pretty blunt to you right now again. One more time, we keep saying it more often than not, and that's how I present the gospel. Don't become a Christian, you'll go to hell for it. Really. I mean, that's kind of a nice title, I ought to write that down right now. It's, Don't become a Christian, you go to hell for it, because you're not. In other words, if you're willing to understand the commitment God holds you to, if you're willing to understand that it's not about a plan, but it's about what God has already done for you, and then wants you to do in response, then yes, by love you would choose to serve him, by love you would choose to follow him, but by love he will tell you that you're going to die for it. One way or another, spiritually or physically or emotionally, but you'll die to something. You can't bring all your idols to heaven. You can't bring your Glock, you can't bring your Harley, you can't bring your car, you can't bring your wife, you can't bring your kids, you can't bring your money bank, you know, or your resume, or your voting record. God don't care. As a matter of fact, God hates it. Jesus himself said, if you don't hate your wife, you can't be my disciple. Well, you know, it's not hard to hate your wife. <laughs> uh oh, divorce. No, I mean, you know, within proper context, in some ways, she's a sinner, saved by grace, just like me. 
Now, I pity her because she lives with me, but other than that, <laughs> you know, hate, well, you know, you got to play within the realm of what Jesus said. I absolutely, without question or quibble or forethought or malice, would choose Jesus before I would ever choose my wife. There is not even a question in my heart. There's not even a doubt in my soul. It would be like automatic. You, you know, I, I gave the uh, analogy or the allegory of, you know, what happens if somebody breaks into your house, you know, and what will you do if they point a gun at your wife? I'd say, shoot her. Hey, I'm not going to defend her. God can do a better job than I can. I don't have to defend her because she's going to heaven. Dying is better than living. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's a mature response. An immature response is to, you know, snatch the gun, take it away from him, process the guy in prison, you know, throw throw away the key and be bitter and anger about it, or whatever that you get to. Because that's not what we're saying about baby Christians. We're saying it's about mature adults in God that are and have become one with the Father and the Son. Because eventually that's where you're going. You're going to become like Jesus doing the will of the Father. You're not yet. I don't care who you are. You know, I'm going to say it. If you're watching this, you're not doing the will of God yet. You will, but you're not yet. You are. Now, how can I say that? I don't know. God said it, so I don't know. <laughs> so we'll move off to that one before somebody you know, writes me and gets furious. What do you mean I'm not doing the will of God? I'm a pastor. Yeah, then I, I know you're a disaster. <laughs> if you're a pastor, you're a disaster. I mean, I... Come on. Let's get real. I mean, we both know. Because I'm in ministry too. I'm a preacher. So, I'm a disaster. Just waiting to happen. All over you. One way or the other. For benefit or for blessing or for curse. Or, you know, for, for worse. You know, who knows. But however God chooses to use us, that's how he uses us. So, in studying maturation means that we have to get past this whole undisciplined life and begin to bring in to incorporate someone who can discipline it for us. And that is the Holy Spirit. That means that someone can literally make you a slave and you have to respond to it. Positively. Jesus doesn't let you off the hook. Jesus doesn't say, hey, you know what? I died so you get to be blessed. So, you know, just take a rest, you know, and kick back and relax and I got it covered. No. If any man would just come after me. So, the first line of our study today that we'll stop at and we'll continue to comment on now as this is our third study is the first line in others may you cannot if God has called you to be truly like Jesus in all your spirit he will draw you into a life of crucifixion and humility we're going to break that down even smaller aren't you glad this may take forever to get through praise the Lord <laughs> we got something to do in eternity. We're going to take that first phrase. If God has called you to be truly like Jesus, that's a big if. I'm not going to go any farther than that. We'll talk about it in all your spirit later, next week. But, or maybe combine the two and say in all your spirit and add that. But right now, we need to ask a question. We need to evaluate ourselves. We have our homework assignment, reading utmost for his highest, getting the book, reading the book, doing the book, living the book, understanding the book. I didn't tell you to read your Bible. I just, that's your choice. Whatever you want to do with that, it's up to you and God. I told you for maturing and becoming mature in the Lord, you need to get that book and you need to understand it, read it, and use it for one year. After that, you're on your own. In our study now, today, I'm telling you, if God has called you to be truly like Jesus, the questions we have to ask you, do you want to be like Jesus? It's a legitimate question. It's sincere. It's honest. There's nothing deceptive about it. You can sit back and evaluate whether you know for a fact that you aren't like Jesus. And that's a pretty easy statement because I can say none of you are. Neither am I. We have a goal and we have a choice and we have a destiny that I'm sure God wants us to be. But I am more than persuaded because we live in America, unless you live in some other country. Because we live in America, we're not like Jesus. I don't care who you are. In the Jesus movement, I might have, you know, qualified that. Because I've met some pretty Jesus-like people. Seriously. 
today, I'm pretty confident that we're all polluted and infected with sin in some way that until we die, we're not getting better, but it's kind of affecting us in a very negative way. While we are getting lighter, but it's only because the darkness is getting darker. There's an expression in Jewish reasoning or logic that says Noah wasn't a righteous man. He was a sinner, but he was righteous in his generation. And what that meant was that he was about the best you could hope for. You've heard that expression, you know, lesser of two evils, like the last election. I mean, people tried to tell me that God's choice is Donald Trump, and I said, no, God allowed the people to choose, and God says, honor the office. It doesn't say that the man is God's choice. So we pray for Donald Trump because he's in the presidency. We pray for him because we're supposed to pray anyways. But that doesn't mean that's God's choice for the presidency, except for this aspect of God choosing him to be there in the presidency. And that's either to make him become a Christian or to condemn him, to commend him to hell. Literally. Sometimes you don't know what God is doing. Be careful. When you pray for something, you might get it. So, getting back to the place of what do you want in growing up? I have to ask you in this study, because this is the point in the direction of our study, is has God called you? Did God call you? Are you aware that God can call you? Do you have a calling? Are you growing or knowing what a calling is? Or do you not understand that there's a call on your life? The call is to come to me. That's all it is. It's not some calling, oh, I got a calling, I'm becoming a pastor. I got a calling, I'm becoming a preacher. I got a calling, I'm an apostle. I got a calling, I'm a prophet. No. The call has gone out into the world. Come. The spirit and the bride say come. Calling and making your calling and election sure is discussing a different topic, but your call, and if God has called you, it's to be like your election is choosing to be promoted to a place of becoming more so like Jesus, that you are actually mature in your way of handling the words that God has spoken, that you can be counted on to not seek your benefit, but the benefit of others, so that you are like Jesus in laying down your life for someone else. And I don't mean your wife, because that's not what it applies to. You can tell me forever in a day that, you know, you're a man, you know, and you're a Christian, and you lay down your life for your wife, you know. I'm going to go, oh, baloney. Bring the wife. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on. We do the best we can, and that's why grace applies. We're saved by grace, by the way, and that's why we are saved. It's because of grace, not because of anything else that we could do. Because we can't do it. We just can't fix it. We just can't redeem it. We just can't buy it. We just can't learn it. We can't do it. We can't. God can and God does, and God will. And so as he does, we have to yield to that. And so that's why we have choices that we make and why Jesus keeps using the word if. The biggest one was to disqualify you to say, if you want to come after him, do you want to come after him? Then you've got to do this. You have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross. You have to follow him. Now, if you've got those three down from the first week, then you know that every week is just building on that. You better be telling yourself, I don't know if I can deny myself, because that's an honest answer. That's mature. But you have to deny yourself daily. If you take up your cross daily and follow Jesus daily, then you're beginning to get a handle on this whole concept that it ain't easy. Matter of fact, it's the toughest thing you'll ever do to grow up as a Christian. It's easy to be a baby Christian. It's easy to be childish. It's easy to be stupid. It's easy to be ignorant. But that's not why we're here, and that's not why I'm telling you these things, or preaching the Word of God to you, but rather providing information that you may allow the Spirit of God in you to grow you up so you can be the person God wants you to be. Which is, again, asking you the question, if God has called you, yes, no, did God call you? Say yes, because if he hasn't, go back to square one, start all over again, and wait until God calls you and you understand what that means and come back and we'll grow you up. Otherwise, I'm sorry. You don't have the criteria to meet what God is saying to you. Did God call you? 
He called to Peter, come. He called to Joshua, come. He called to any of the disciples, come. Did God call you? If you don't know, go back and start at square one. Sorry. Go find out if God's called you. We'll give you a few minutes to leave. I mean, if I was in a building too, and I'd say, hey, I want to take five minutes, you know, to let you guys, you know, get a handle on this. I'm not gaming it. I'd walk up to you and say, look, God hasn't called you. Get out. If I thought God had told me to say that, which, you know, frankly, I don't think he has yet, but recognize day one, we said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. That wasn't a metaphor. That was a literal. You want to crawl up on a cross and nail yourself to it? Go ahead. You'll discover very quickly that you know what it means then to be a Christian, and it's not something that's easily done. It's only done by the cost being paid and the price being levied against you, which is you can't save your life. You gotta lose it. Seriously. Because God will give you life if you lose your life. Otherwise, you're just gaming it and defaming the name of the Lord. So like I said, I'm going to take a minute just to pray, you know, and let God say to you what you should do. Father, thank you for taking those people away who aren't ready today to grow up. Take them to the place where they can hear your voice, learn your will, and become babies, desiring and needing and requiring the milk of the word that they should grow up to get to know you better so that they can come back and learn to become men and women of God. So, now that we've eliminated the wheat from the chaff, the People who are willing to go the extra mile, who are willing to say, I'm not good. Not me. I am one who needs more than anything else discipline in my life. Now that we admit that we can't do it, but we want it, and God has called us to it, then we can answer the question, has God called you? Yes, he did, but I don't get it. I'm not worthy. You're right. You're not. That's why he called you. You're not worthy. You're not right. You're messed up. You're a baby. That's why we are teaching the class. That's why we are giving the Bible study. That's why we are talking from the realm of the Spirit of God. That you might grow up into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. Because you are not worthy. If you were, you wouldn't be here and I'd throw you out. Because if you tell me you've arrived, I don't want to listen to you. I don't care that you're there. I care whether or not you need God and you can answer the questions. Has God called you? Yes. Good. Then are you ready to be like Jesus? I am. Good. Get out. Go start a religion. Or go witness. Or go start a Bible study. But don't tell me you, being like me, don't need to be like Jesus daily. I'm a sinner. I need this Bible study. I need this incorporated in my life. I need to walk, talk, be led of the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, and have God's Spirit tell me that I have been called to this, grow up, become like Jesus. So that I can say at the end of this study right now, today, as we close this, if God has called you to be truly like Jesus, yes. God has called me to be truly like Jesus. I don't need it if I have a punctuation mark. Do you get it? That's faith. By faith you are saved and not out of yourself. By grace you are saved and not of yourself. You have to grow in faith to be a man. You have to be able to say, God has called me to be truly like Jesus. God has called me to be like Jesus. God has called me. He has told me, be like Jesus. And we'll end it there. So, that's the bottom line of where we are now in our studies. You are called. 
You are chosen, as it were. We haven't gotten to that point yet. You are anointed. We are nowhere near that part yet. But you are wanting is where we're at. You are desiring. You know that God has called you, but you want to be grown up so that you could be mature enough to be, who knows, maybe like me, you know, given some stupid study, you know, and say, make a fool of yourself, you know, and just go out there and talk, and I'll give you the words to speak. Okay, I can be a fool. No problem there, Lord. You just want my, you know, flapping lips to go, and then you'll take over. Yeah, that's what I want you to do. Okay, I'm, sign me up, man. I'm all there. I don't have to go to school, and I don't have to, you know, get a PhD, a THD, and everything else. No, he said just loose the lips. Okay, Lord, they're loose, ready to go. Let's go. Okay, great, I got it. Sit back and watch and see what I can do. That's my credentials. <laughs> I can just see thousands of people running out of the auditorium now. Ah, I'm gonna be out of there. He's a wacko. <laughs> I'm a wacko for Jesus. <laughs> so remember now. God bless you, but remember now. Get your book. Read your book. Do your book. It's not a book that's going to tell you the practical things, what to do, where to be, how to see, you know, or anything like that. Um, it's going to be more blunt than you want it to be. Um, like I said today, in reading it to you from chapter, or from January 12th, have you ever been alone with God? And it says, Our solitude with Did Jesus not take us alone? And expound things to us all the time. He expounds things to us as we understand them. And then I just backed off because I wanted you to go, That was rough. Because, baby, if you read that, that was rough. <laughs> the rest of it. Because when you get to paragraph two, Woo! <laughs> like I said, Woohoo! We're on a ride. Boy, was God right on. Boom! Slap! Knock you around, buddy! Because <laughs> to be honest with you, if you really want a mamby-pamby, you know, wimpy, wishy-washy, you know, sugar-coated pastor to tell you, it's okay. All you gotta do is pray, read your Bible every day, and you'll find yourself wake up one day in heaven. Yes. Ah. No hell, just heaven. Hell no! <laughs> I want somebody to whip me into shape. I want that macro exercise program or machine. Dance moves. <laughs> Dance exercise, whatever. But seriously, don't take it for granted you are arrive. You're not a mature adult. I'm pretty sure of that. I'm pretty confident of that, so that's why I can say it to you. You look at me and if you think I'm mature or mature, eh, you know, I, I have my moments. I'm not going to say I am. I'm not going to say I'm not. To deny would be as much a sin to qualify what God has done from the beginning to the end with me that I cannot put a spin on the maturation I have, but what God does with me is causes me to become all things to any man, lest by any means I might save some, that I really do can become you know, foolish or wise or mature or immature for the sake of the gospel, so that someone, somewhere, someday, in one way or another, or even one person one day will turn to and ask Jesus to save them. Because really, I mean, I love the idea of you want to grow up. You know, frankly, um, you will, one way or another, because the Great Tribulation is coming. You know, we are in the last days of the last, the last moments of the last days, of the last hours, of the last weeks, of the last months, of the last generation. It's that close. And you got to last. <laughs> That's a lot of lasting. So, in order to become lasting, or overcomer, as the Bible would say, you have to grow up. You have to become mature. And that's why we have this class on maturation.